So researchers in California have identified what they're calling a super strength antibody that blocks the most infectious elements of the coronavirus. But these neutralizing antibodies were found in fewer than 5% of recovered COVID-19 patients. So this is really interesting because there are all number of antibodies that um, you, know, you may develop once you've been exposed to the virus, but not all of them indicate that you'd be immune moving forward. So for more on this, we are joined by internal medicine specialist, Dr. Nita Ogden. Of course, I tried to explain antibodies, but doctor, you can do it better than me. So tell me, you know, why this discovery is important. Yeah, so we've learned a lot uh, about these neutralizing antibodies. Now they're being called super strength antibodies. So what exactly are they? So these antibodies target the spike protein of the coronavirus. And that gives it that classic look of those spikes coming out uh, of the virus. And that spike protein is essential to the virus attaching itself to human cells. So these neutralizing antibodies effectively keep the virus from entering human cells and could essentially knock out the infection. The problem is we don't know enough about how these neutral neutralizing antibodies work in terms of how long they last. Uh, what levels do we need to have that protective immunity? And do they prevent reinfection? Um, so, and the other thing, as you mentioned, is that they were only found in less than 5% of people who had coronavirus infection. Um, what we see actually is a whole spectrum of antibody presentations. In 10 to 20% of patients uh, who've recovered from coronavirus infection, there are no antibodies detected. In 75% of patients, we see antibodies, but they're not the neutralizing antibodies, and they could be transient. They don't last for that long. Um, and then again, in these uh, less than 5% of patients, neutralizing antibodies occur. We do know that they occur 11 to 21 days post-infection, um, and they do persist for a while. It's just not clear exactly how long. So what's important here for researchers is to see how we can effectively use these neutralizing antibodies now that we know what they do. Uh, researchers are trying to clone the B cells that produce them so that we can then mass produce the antibodies and re-inject them into people who might be sick to see if they lessen infection. And then there's also a goal for the vaccine. Uh, does a vaccine produce neutralizing antibodies? And again, what levels do we need to uh, really produce durable immunity? Uh, doctor, uh, some medical professionals are warning that the first COVID vaccines may not stop people from catching the coronavirus, but instead, they may just prevent people from getting really sick or dying. Uh, what does this mean for the fight moving forward? You know, I think that that's a very realistic statement about this first generation of the vaccine because we are in this race to produce the vaccine. It may not be perfect in terms of sterilizing immunity, which means complete prevention of the infection. In fact, some of the early studies of these, uh, you know, early virus can uh, vaccine candidates in animals have shown they did prevent infection in the lungs, like that horrible severe pneumonia, but the virus was still detected on some mild level in the upper respiratory tract, like in the nose. So what would that look like practically? Uh, perhaps a vaccine means that you get a more mild infection, maybe just a cold, uh, maybe a very, very mild sinus infection, but it prevents you from ending up in the hospital with that severe pneumonia, ventilator, that kind of uh, really severe disease. So it's more of a mitigating virus. Um, and, and the same thing goes with in terms of durability of the immunity. Uh, we may need a boost for this vaccine. We may need more than one dose. Um, I think later generations of this vaccine may lead to a one and done, but it's, many scientists don't feel that we're going to be there yet when it first comes out. All right, so now this conversation turns to crap. Just saying, I need to lighten the mood a little. Uh, there's a study out that suggests that um, when you flush the toilet, you could create a cloud, if you will, a plume of coronavirus that lingers in the air uh, long enough for someone else to inhale it. Um, can you yeah. talk to us a little wow. bit about that? I mean, <laughs> is this a serious concern? I know I'm, I'm trying to be light because I'm a 12 year old inside and I know that we're talking about, you know, stuff like that. Um, but how serious of a concern is this and what should people be doing? <laughs> 
Well, you know, it, it, it is something. It's a, it was a computer modeling study out of China, which um, says that when we flush the toilet, uh, yeah, a cloud of uh, particulate matter containing fecal matter that can contain the coronavirus uh, gets expelled into the air and can reach up to three feet. Uh, we know that coronavirus can remain in aerosols for up to three hours. Uh, so the thinking here is that, you know, when you enter a bathroom that may not even even be in your home, uh, you should be wearing a mask because potentially coronavirus could be aerosolized in that air. Uh, but the more important thing is to close the, the lid of the toilet when you flush it so that you're not exposed to, um, and, and other people in your home potentially are not exposed to that fecal matter, wipe down your seat, and most importantly, uh, common hygiene practices, wash your hands with soap and water. The thing is, is that, you know, we do know the coronavirus can live and replicate in the digestive tract. Uh, researchers have even thought about using sewage to track outbreaks in communities. But what we don't know is what the viral load in these aerosolized fecal matter could be, and is it really infectious? So it's something to sort of tuck away and keep in your mind, um, but uh, just really some small practices like closing the lid and washing your hands for now uh, should probably keep this at bay. Uh, we just still don't know even if coronavirus is, has a strong uh, fecal oral transmission. So this is all sort of theoretical. Hmm. Well, all I can say, Emory and doctor, is uh, to my parents and family and Freudian therapists uh, who gave me grief over the years for never using a public bathroom, I was right. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you, true. Dr. Nita <laughs> Hogman. We appreciate it. <laughs> Good so information. Much.